Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard the Pilot Lawyer Podcast. Thank you for your attention while this important legal information is reviewed. What you hear should not replace consultation with an attorney and should not be considered advice for your situation. On behalf of the Pilot Lawyer and your entire crew, it's our pleasure to have you aboard. Welcome, aviators, to the Pilot Lawyer Podcast with us, the Eisen Brothers at the Eisen Law Firm. You're here for what we do best, navigating the FAA medical certification process for pilots and those who want to become pilots. Around the office, we say if you don't laugh, you cry. So for the next 30 minutes, we hope to bring you the lighter side of what can otherwise be a frustrating process. So whether you're laughing at us or with us, join us, brothers, as we discuss the fascinating world of FAA medical certification. We've been at this for over a year now with the podcast, and we've been ignoring the elephant in the room. What's the deal with the difference between a lawyer and maybe a service that helps you with your medical? We've ignored that topic. We've ignored I that think, topic. I don't well, think we, we have. We've think, ignored the most important I think piece. we've been involved in some skirmishes on that there's, point. There's some skirmishes. <laughs> The, internal the, and external. Probably the most important thing, though, that I've been reminded of this week for individuals listening is the idea that what you tell a lawyer is likely to be covered under the attorney-client privilege, whereas what you tell someone who's a non-lawyer, even a doctor, in many cases, that may be assisting you with the FAA medical certification process. Specifically AMEs? AMEs, anything else, is not going to be covered under any type of confidentiality. Now, sure, they may have you sign a confidentiality agreement. But let me ask you this, Christopher. If I wanted to get a subpoena and get information out of an entity, would a confidentiality agreement get me as far as a hill of beans? Probably not. That's what I mean. I mean, it's probably going to be dependent on the jurisdiction in which it was signed and what those laws specific to that jurisdiction say. It's probably going to be a you know a state law issue, so it gets real complicated real quick. And why complicate an already complicated situation with, That's what the, I'm with the concern of confidentiality? Just go to a lawyer, and you know it's going to be if you engage a lawyer in conversation at a party. Let's say you're not at a law office. You're not in a place of business. You're just standing around and you're just gabbing with other fellow patrons at this party. And you, you get introduced to Steve and you come to find out Steve's an attorney and you just rear-ended not, you know, the day before. Not your fault. And you say, hey, Steve, what kind of law do you practice? Oh, I do personal injury. Oh, okay, okay. Well, hey, listen, uh, I was just rear-ended yesterday and uh, I got, you know, I got some pain here. And I, what do you think I should do? Do you, you know, and so now you and Steve are talking about the potential arguments that you might have, the potential claims that you might have, uh, so on and so forth. But you tell Steve, hey, listen, you know, I had another accident, you know, two years ago with similar injuries. And so now you start telling Steve all these kind of intimate details that might actually be a pretty good defense for the at-fall party. Well, I think in a situation like that, there's enough being discussed that you might, I would say that an attorney-client privilege has already been established because you're engaging this individual, even though it's in an informal setting, you're engaging the individual with respect to a specific case and how it might impact you. And he's giving you legal advice. So even though there's been well, no the exchange there, of money or anything. The problem there though, with that scenario, if you will. There's other people. There are other people. Yeah, okay. Well, let's say you well, take so Steve the, off to the, yeah. the, the back room. <laughs> hey, Steve, come <laughs> back here. <laughs> Steve, you got something I, to show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> tell me first. <laughs> take me to dinner. But sure. In, in, under a scenario like that, let's let's assume that there isn't some gotcha where the uh, attorney-client privilege is, is eviscerated because of... The, being other people around that are, are listening to the conversation. Sure, I'll spot you that. But the point there is that you don't necessarily have to have such a, you know, you don't need to have a contract with the attorney. You don't need to have, have an exchange of monies with the attorney. I mean, if you go to an individual who you know is an attorney, you start asking them legal advice about, you know, prospective case or something like that, and they start engaging with you in that, they're under the ethics rules, I think is enough established to say, hey, listen, you got an attorney-client privilege. 
Yeah. You so know. the what? So, so this other guy can't go out this, and start telling. If this the guy comes around and says, "Hey, you know, I was smoking a doob at the time I got yeah. her into the first time." You know, well, that's turning high privilege information. Yeah. So the point there is that you're not going to get that necessarily with a non-attorney service in the medical certification process. If you go to somebody and they say, hey, what do you do? Oh, well, I help airmen get to establish your medical eligibility. Okay, well, you know, are you an attorney? No, 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 I'm just, you know, insert whatever profession you want to say there. Well, if they start engaging with you in that conversation and giving you advice, fine. But the problem is, is that anything you're telling that individual could essentially be used against you as an admission by a party opponent, per se. Not only that, but any of the documents that... If, it were, if it were to come out. I yeah. mean, they'd have to really do some rooting around, enough, probably. Sure. But still. But even still, like documentation is generated by this entity and so on, uh, for the most part, could become discoverable. Yeah, so, so let's say you start off with a, an attorney service... Or not, uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's say you That's start off. That's ideal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to start off with her. But let's say you start off with a, a, a service that assists in the, you know, obtaining of medical certification. And throughout the process, you're just dealing with the Office of Aerospace Medicine. And they send requests. You generate the requests. You know, you, you discuss the options with the individuals you've engaged. There's correspondence going back and forth. You... I mean, come up with a game plan as to what to do. You go and you execute that game plan. You submit all that documentation to the FAA and they come back and they deny you for whatever reason. And then eventually you find yourself down to where you, you might have the opportunity to petition the NTSB for review of that denial. And then you get into litigation and now you have the FAA on the other side defending the denial. And one of the things they could do, you know, because they're going to have a copy of the Airman Medical File if they see that there's been any correspondence from these other entities, in theory, they could do a request for information to that, you know, they could do a subpoena, they could request a subpoena to that service provider asking for a complete copy of all the correspondence back and forth between you and them with respect to their engagement and helping you get the medical certificate. Uh, they could do a request for production of documents, uh, that might be in your possession with respect to anything that's been said, so on and so forth. So, I mean, it's, it's, but with an attorney, that concern is is muted. Let me say this much, though. May I? Am I off the mark on that? You're right on the mark. I mean, you, you're, you're right there thinking, the hey, listen, if if I was gonna have, if I was gonna have this guy represent me, he sounds like an idiot. Yeah, I probably well. Well, that's, that's goes saying. well, I just wanted to clear the air there. I wanted to get it out there. Because is this, this entirely wait, self-serving. Wait, are you telling me that this podcast this is an isn't intro. even on? This, this is, is an intro. We're not even talking the, about that? No, no. I wasted all, I wasted eight minutes. Yeah, eight minutes. Just to yakking learn. about. Yeah, well, I want people to hear that. I think they need to know it. It's self-serving for sure. Well, isn't but this whole it's podcast also, The whole thing is self-serving. But at the same time, it's, uh, I think it's a relevant conversation. People don't think about it. So it's too late. Too far okay. in the weeds. Oh, Alex has something to say. He said it. <laughs> I said it. Well, actually, I'll, I'll bring this Some up. Some people are too far in the weeds. I shaved my head recently, and uh, the yeah. headsets feel different on my head. Maybe it's Alex that brings this podcast down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we're talking about here today is uncomplicated anxiety, depression, and related conditions for all classes of medical certification based on the new guidelines, new-ish guidelines identified and posted by the FAA on or about May 29th, 2024. I have received a lot of emails and a lot of text messages and a lot of pings and dings on this guidance. And no, it probably won't help your case. But we'll talk about who it will help. Let's just get to the brass tacks here. It gives the Amy an opportunity to issue a medical certificate, but it doesn't mean that the FAA is not going to come not well, it's, it's the, the same yeah. thing as PTSD guidelines, as far as adjustment disorder guidelines were. It's it what what is inclined to happen is that even if you meet the criteria to be issued, the and the AME issues a medical certificate, the FAA doesn't trust you or the AME. In my opinion, they're going to follow up with an info request letter. Say, okay, we see your AME issued your medical. That's great. That's the tops. 
but we need to see all of your medical records. Maybe we even need to see a letter from your doctor or even a psychiatrist to verify that you meet this criteria or that you're not otherwise presenting with an aromatically significant mental health condition that would be inclined for concern due to reoccurrence of symptoms or that we think needs to be mitigated in some fashion. So just because your AME issues a medical certificate as may be authorized under these new guidelines, it doesn't mean the FAA is not going to potentially follow up with you and ask for more info. So I don't think we've seen enough of these cases roll through yet to where we've started to see those letters, but I'm, I guarantee that's going to shock people. I mean, it's only been in effect for like 14 days. Yeah. So what is it? Well, the FAA is now allowing AMEs, and to some extent they have been, but they've sort of broadened the scope in, in, of cases where an airman with uncomplicated anxiety, depression, and related conditions to be able to issue a medical certificate without requiring deferral for certain criteria. So some of these diagnoses are generalized anxiety disorder. And I think that's probably a big one. I think that's a good one. Otherwise, general anxiety disorder would otherwise typically be something that would get deferred. So if I wore hats, I would take it off. That's a good one. I think that's a helpful one. But again- I'm not taking my hat off. Eh, please don't. <laughs> Seboric dermatitis. Uh, what is that? Uh, dandruff. You got a lot of dandruff. I can't, you, be, uh, can't afford that flow into the air. So generalized anxiety disorder, that's a good one. Probably very helpful to some folks. But again, you're going to get info requested on the back end, I would expect. Situational anxiety, and they have on here AKA, which is just assuming everyone knows what AKA means. That's your gun, right? <laughs> <laughs> AKA adjustment disorder with anxiety. Okay. Social anxiety disorder and unspecified anxiety. I would say probably the, the cases that we see where it's just generalized anxiety disorder or actually situational anxiety, probably pretty low. Adjustment disorder we'll see quite a bit, but it gets really complicated. But hang on, let me go before you, I see you revving up. But oh, boy. There are other conditions. Postpartum depression. Situational depression, a.k.a. adjustment disorder with depressed mood. Situational anxiety and, and depression. Adjustment disorder with mixed anxiety and, un, and depressed mood and unspecified depression. And obsessive compulsive disorder. That's a good one. That's something that probably is helpful for folks. Post traumatic stress disorder. Well, they already have a code for that. And V code and Z code table items. So, really, what this is getting at is adjustment disorder, which already had its own thought process. Can a, and, can a male have postpartum depression? I mean, they can nowadays. Well, they got sure. the pregnant emotion. Yes. But legitimately, like, does it have to be? Well, have that, you ever I been postpartum? It, no, well, I'm just saying. Well, there's your answer. Your spouse, well, you said the first thing that came out of your mouth. Well, naturally, I mean, no. as, a, as an inclusive whole. Well, the, you, the spouse you just had a baby. You just had and, a, and the spouse well, has a baby. In the Christian then, sense that you become one and have a baby, sure, you have I mean, postpartum depression. Technically, we are postpartum. You're also in, you don't go on maternity but leave. Paternity. <laughs> paternity. 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 So there's a distinction between man and wife. <laughs> and paternity, what is it? Postpartum, postpartum, partum, fraternity, partum. There's a lot of P's there. There's things that kind of be male oriented. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it's crazy though, but I don't know. I don't I've know. never I seen said, someone. I don't know. Yeah, is, I don't it, is, it, is it like a partum? No, no, no. We're getting way off track here. But it's this like, is why people don't like this show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you got these. Podcast. You got. Well, it's a show. <laughs> it's a show. It's a, it's a show. It's a showman show. We got the lights on. The lights are on. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, these are these the diagnoses. That, okay. Well. Oh, you piqued my interest. That's what the AME will say. Oh, you put this down? Okay, we'll see. We'll move on to the next flow chart. Okay. Has your FAA medical certificate been denied? Are you concerned you may not be able to get a medical certificate from the FAA? Are you at risk for FAA action for failing to report your medical history appropriately? Call the pilot lawyer at 1-855-FAA-1215 to discuss your options for getting the FAA to issue your medical certificate and get you flying. We are happy to evaluate your case and discuss with you a plan for presenting your case to the AME or the FAA. Aviation law is all we do, nothing else. 
So that's those are the conditions. Now, part of the algorithm, if you will, is that the FAA will allow issuance if up to two listed conditions are treated with any combination of psychotherapy. So if you have a psychotherapist, even if it's current, even if you currently have a psychotherapist and medication. Now here's where it gets here's where it gets dicey. A single mental health medication last taken, prescribed, or recommended two or more years ago. And that's going to get a lot of people right there. Yeah. You know, that's going to throw them off because they're going to be like, well, I wouldn't take it. I, I wasn't taking it. You know, I, I never I never took it. I never took it. Well, was it recommended? Well, now, now that's a, we've, we've opened the floodgates. Yeah. Well, here comes the flood. Right. So <laughs> this includes when the treating physician changed medications for better treatment response, provided only one medication was taken at a time and last use was more was two or more years ago. So here's here's the rub. I would say a lot of cases we see individuals this sort of the the vast majority of individuals are treated with more than one medication. Seems to be how medicine is handled these days. And so my concern is that somebody will say, Oh yeah, I was only treated with Lexapro. And then the FAA follows up with an info request and comes to find out you would not only treated with Lexapro, you're also treated with Wellbutrin or something at the same time, you know, or I'm going to give you uh, Lexapro just to help you sleep at night. I'm going to give you some Trazodone. That's going to disqualify you right there. This just reeks of an info request. I it mean, reeks, no, we've said that before, but I... It, we just said it a second ago. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying it again. I'm just saying it at the same time. I, the listener <laughs> needs to be aware. So here's what the <laughs> FAA says. The, F, the AME should gather information regarding the diagnosis, severity, treatment, symptoms, and address all of the questions on the uncomplicated anxiety, depression, and related conditions decision tool for the AME. So right there is where you already need help. Whether it's us or it's us, you're gonna, need, you're, gonna, you're gonna need help because the AME should gather information. Well, you should go into the exam. If you just go in there and say, "Hey, Amy, gather this," that, the AME's not gonna do that. Number one, number two, you gotta go in there ready to go. Say, "Hey, I meet these criteria," and so that's where having somebody help you or doing it competently on your own, making sure before you go into the AME, you have all these things together. And so, essentially, there's this flow chart now that's a decision tool. That if the AME can say no to all of these questions, then the AME can issue the medical certificate. What so if you can't say, what if you, can you say no to all these questions? No. Oh, Ooh. yes. <laughs> all right. So the questions are as follows. Oh boy. I got about nine questions here. That should have some time on this podcast. Actually, uh, there are exactly nine questions. Exactly. <laughs> Does the individual have any additional mental health diagnosis or symptoms such as bipolar disorder, psychosis, neurodevelopmental disorder, autism, ADHD, it doesn't meet fast track requirements, which is dumb because if you have generalizing anxiety, if you have any of these conditions and you have ADHD, you don't meet criteria for the fast track program. You have to go the standard track for ADHD and all of this is moot. Personality disorder, impulse control disorders, Substance misuse or disorder, eating disorder, or any diagnosis not listed as acceptable. You didn't uh, mention a somatoform disorder. Well, I was afraid of saying it wrong. Okay. You know? So now not only do I have the opportunity to address it, <laughs> to identify why I can't say it right. So, okay, let's just play it out and say, yeah, I've ne my doctor never diagnosed me with anxiety and depression. Okay. No. Any history of suicidal or homicidal ideation, attempts, or self-harm behavior, such as cutting, ever in their life. So, you know, there's that. Any history of any involuntary it, mental but, health... Oh, let me go back up there real quick. The self-harm behavior. If you look on the uh, 8500 application, there's really... The self-harm is kind of... Not really something that would necessarily get, get captured there, I guess. Would you say? Yeah, Easily. I, would say, I would say not. Because the question is a uh, suicide attempt, right? At 18, I think yeah, it's 18P. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the, they're going to be gassing. So, so now they get, so they're even more broad in scope on this than they are on the application. That's right. Because now we're talking about self-harm. And what is self-harm? I, mean, I don't say I this mean, I guess cutting. I don't say there's an example. I don't say like self mutilation or something like that. I suppose. I was gonna say I don't say this. I would like to say it at all. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the, uh, but the thing is, speak, speak freely, sir. <laughs> Not to be flipping about this, I know it's a serious question, but self harm. I mean, technically, the way I eat, <laughs> you know, is self harm. So I mean, you could really. I think there's an yeah. intent there, though. You intend to eat because it brings you joy, and I think <laughs> self harm is probably. Sure, so, but what, are, what is like I guess somebody who puts themselves in you know extreme circumstances? You know that you know that could potentially be. I mean, self-harming. well, skydiving. You, know, you have, yeah, to, yeah, that you could have be to eat to survive. You don't have to cut yourself for any reason. You know, I mean, there's no reason to cut yourself purposely. Unless I'm trying to, bleed unless, I guess. Off I guess unless you have a surgery. Bleed but, off I mean, that's different. That's, but that's yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna do self surgery again. <laughs> so anyhow, but it's, uh, my point being well, is it's very point, broad. It's very broad. That was my point. Was, oh my gosh, it's the same point. Our, our no, points no, are sinking. Seriously. Yeah, but seriously though, I mean, this this isn't the type of stuff that normally would be captured. I think on Correct. 8500 in such minute detail. So now they're yeah. they're really getting into the weeds. So you got to come to this knowing more than you might otherwise. You got to yeah. really know your your medical. Sure, file. I had anxi- I meet all these criteria, but when I had anxiety and. Treated with medic one medication, I thought about cutting myself. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, okay. Alex has given me the head motion to move on. Move it on. Okay. Any history of any involuntary mental health or substance use evalu- evaluation, inner court ordered treatment, including involuntary transport. So it's not just treatment. Involuntary treatment. It's not like hey, I went to the hospital and I was involuntarily. Spend a month there or whatever. This is just any evaluation. I mean, technically, when you go to your doctor for like a checkup, don't they do? Well, I went there volunteer. My mom drove me. Yeah, vol- yeah. <laughs> well, I was trying to think. Well, maybe like if you had like a, an arrest or something, and as part of the court order, you know, whether it's part of your probationary terms or just diversion program. Just, There's yeah, also diversion that you had to undergo a substance. Was it a good example comes to mind. But you're still going to have to report that most likely anyhow, which probably going to... Which goes back up to the first one for substance misuse and disorder. I mean... We've got all sorts of thoughts there. there. Okay, moving on. Any history of any forms of the following treatment modalities? Electroconvulsive, transcranial magnetic stimulation, ketamine, or psychedelic therapy. All right. History of a mental health hospitalization. Okay, so if you if you fail five, you'll have already failed three, the involuntary mental health evaluation. So seemingly you're going to get, well, I guess you could show up voluntarily to the hospital, but even still, if you're hospitalized, you don't qualify. Has the individual experienced more than one episode? Now, this is where it gets into the bigger picture of if they're feeling, if you there is, for example, if it's depressive disorder, depressive symptoms, if there's, more than one episode, the concern is that a recurrence of events may require a SSRI medication to mitigate that risk for recurrent symptoms, which is pretty typical of what we're seeing right now. If you have a legitimate diagnosis of major depressive disorder recurrent, you're going to require SSRI medication and SN, one of the antidepressant medications. I feel like we see overall, though... I- a lot of doctors will just put the recurrent modifier on that. Just throw it, it really on there. Isn't. Yeah. Just th- they will flippantly put that on there. That's where you maybe have to look at this and say, well, is this really recurrent or not? So there's that. The condition has unresolved sequela. Is that how you say that? I've always said it like yeah. that. Sequela. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Or continued symptoms <laughs> severe enough to interfere with safety-related duties. So if you go in there and you're still having symptoms or your symptoms were so severe at the time the AME felt like, hey, you know what? This might be a problem. Well, how are they going to prove that though? That's I feel a tough there's one. Your, your, there's your info request right there. Mental health medications. Multiple medications have been used at the same time or use of any medication has continued during the last two years. And lastly, does the licensed mental health specialist, treating clinician, or the AME have any concerns? Whoa, whoa I didn't come here expecting uh, to be queried about my mental health specialist thoughts. I wasn't prepared to, to, to speak on that matter. Well, then, you weren't expecting you to that? be queried? 
I feel like question. if I went in armed with a letter from my treating, <laughs> and now that now this sounds like a hostage takeover. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> you should you should go in. You should go in. You should plan ahead. That's, Come into our interrogation room. <laughs> really, that's the, kind of the whole idea of aviation, though, isn't it? Planning ahead. It's not really just a spur of the moment, jump in the plane, and let's see what happens. You know, mentality. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, really, when you're doing your medical application, you, you you should plan ahead, just like you would when you're pre-flighting your aircraft, or or checking, you know, the weather, or you know, doing a pre-flight plan, or what, whatever the case may be. I yes, think sir. I think that's a that should track. It's tracking. It's tracking. If it doesn't, then you probably aren't going to be able to answer some of these questions. <laughs> so there's the decision tool now. Woo, daddy, what else do we got here? Some of the things that they say they'll definitely not allow you to issue if you have recurrent episodes or symptoms, like we've said, uh, more than one mental health medication at the same time, or diagnosed with major depressive disorder or persistent depressive disorder, dysthymia. Um, some of the other conditions that they would include in this as potentially being acceptable is uncomplicated bereavement, relationship distress with spouse or intimate partner. Whoa, what, what? That's right. Parent child that at? right here. Under note. Parent child relational problem and phase of life problem. So there's that. So wait, with those V codes, they're saying if you have a history of uncomplicated bereavement or relationship distress, like you should still be reporting that on the eighty five hundred? Yes, sir. That's what they're saying here. Jeez. And he can I How mean, many people has, are out there doing that? Very little. I mean if it has a I guess if it has an ICD-10 code and it's a diagnosis, they're Thanks. popping up. Listen, they've got an ICD code literally for being hit by an airplane on a tarmac. I mean, like, so... <laughs> that sounds like a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that sounds like, code, you're dead. Mm-hmm. I, I can't imagine how Only pranked me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so some of the other things they scratch. identify as definitely required deferral. Like I said, previously on an SISC for SSRI use... Recurrent episodes or symptoms, uh, like I said, more than one mental health medication. We already said this. So, got any thoughts on this, Christopher? Should you hire an attorney or a, or a service to prep you? I think for you this? should just go in there and wing it. Yeah, that just makes sense. Cold turkey. Just that don't even sense. look at anything today. Just go in there and fill it out in the. In don't the even lobby. take a wingman in with you. <laughs> yeah. You want to know something interesting? I, obviously, all that was unjust. Uh, I think you should get an attorney. But uh, we were listening to the Jerry Seinfeld on uh, what podcast was that? It was it was uh, uh, David Spade David Spade one. and Dana Carvey. Yes, sir. And Jerry Seinfeld made an interesting point that he likes the David Spade and Dana Carvey podcast because they don't sit there and pick at each other. You know, he he found that form of comedy, I guess, low. Well, he shouldn't listen to this. Are you trying to, <laughs> so pick at each other like, hey, you're fat and bald? Yeah, or, like it's like, I guess it's just low hanging fruit of humor or something. But it's funny, Jerry. Is it? Is it? I don't know. I didn't I find know. that podcast to be all that funny myself. I didn't either. Well, were they marketing it? Even though it was a bunch of comedians, were they trying to market it as funny? comedy or was it just. But it's three look? supposed funny people. I yeah, mean, that's the thing. I mean, be, that's your whole shtick. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Of course, people might listen to this and say, are they really lawyering? Yeah. Are this guy's lawyer? One of, one of them's not even a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Them, that's them on. picking on us. Picking on <laughs> well, it's just a big, it's a big circular. That's a, that's a big question mark. Circular logic. So anyhow, um, my thinking here is that, yeah, this is great, but... Okay. All right. I think well, there's still some loopholes. So... Uh, <laughs> So I guess we can stop saying so and just wrap this one up. I guess, uh, I guess so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, you've logged another uneventful half hour listening to the Pilot Lawyer Podcast. And even though this uncomplicated anxiety, depression, and related conditions flowchart is... uh, It's become complicated. is, Is getting more and more complicated by the second... We are the Eisen Brothers at the Eisen Law Firm. We hope you have a good day. We'll talk to you next time. This is the podcastfactory.com.
Oh, my God.